Hello, everybody. My name is Paul, if you uh, didn't know. Um, and um, today I want to tell you, actually, a the reason I'm here is because I think learning is the number one social justice issue of this century. Uh, and I hope to be able to convince you to believe what I believe in the next 25 minutes. And then I'm going to go ahead and open it up for any questions that anyone may have. So here we go. So in 2003, that's a, you know, kind of a long time ago, maybe you were born, maybe you weren't, I don't know. Um, I walked out of a hotel room with a drug dealer who had warrants out in about five or six states had just tried to jump out of the car that we were driving in because he'd been up for like four days on meth and was waving a gun around in the air with about $20,000 of drugs sitting on the table. And that was the seminal moment in my life when my life course history changed. And I hope to be able to tell you a little bit about how that actually happened. But first, I'd like to tell you about Ten Books of Home, the nonprofit that I founded, uh, what is that, six years later. So, Ten Books of Home is a nonprofit here in East Palo Alto. And what we do is provide a learning model called Intrinsic Learning Motivation Cultivation. And basically, what it means is what it says right here. What we want to do is we want to feed the brain what it seeks to understand. We don't think about learning in terms of skills in terms of output or in terms of behavior. We actually see learning as happening in your brain and satisfying a need to understand. When the human being can feed their brain with what it is they want to understand, we actually think that you can develop more skills, knowledge, and abilities than any other educational approach that currently exists. So before I jump in, I want to give you a couple of terms that I think will help you to understand what I'm saying. The first is intrinsic learning motivations. This is what I just described. We think in, in, in each of you, and we'll do a little mind experiment in a little bit to see if you can identify what your ILM is. In each of you, you have something that you love to learn about. And probably a lot of things that you love to learn about. And we call those ILMs. When you're actually learning about what it is you love to learn about, or what your brain seeks to understand, we call that intrinsic learning, or ILMing. Okay? And then finally, when you're actually developing skills, knowledge, abilities, based on your ILMs, based on the things that you actually are attracted to naturally, you are cultivating your ILMs. And that's the name of our plot. So we'll see how these whole, how these terms hold up in your in your brains as I go through here. So what's the process of ILM look like? Well, you can see over on your left, uh, very pixelated. I'm uncertain why that is. Uh, yeah. Uh, time out. Twenty second time out on the floor. <laughs>
So what are our kids ILM about? Lots of stuff. Basically anything that they discover they want to learn about. And so what we do is we show up to a lesson and we bring a bunch of stuff and we throw it on the floor. Not exactly, but we do. It's called a bag dump. And then learners go through and figure out what they like and then the lessons take place from there. And they do anything from building, assembling, sewing, reading, pouring, cutting, tying, you name it. And our learners are doing it. So you might be like, whoa, 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 but like, don't kids need to know like letters, numbers, colors, shapes to be ready for kindergarten? Like, isn't that like so important? Of course. <clears throat> that was kind of high pitch, sorry. <laughs> of course they do. But what we argue at Temple to Hope is you don't need to teach any of that because that is in everything. Think about this for a second. Letters, numbers, colors, shapes, language, sound, texture. Everything you do involves all of that. So what we do is teach our role models some cultivation skills for how to actually talk with kids and how to make learning opportunities out of the activities they do so that they can be learning these core concepts and skills simultaneously. So let's say I have a puppet over here. Hello, how are you, boy? I'm good. Okay, this puppet, it has a texture. I can feel the puppet. It's making sounds while I talk. It's producing language. It has certain shapes on it. It is a shape. The patterns on it may form a shape. It, is, it has different colors on it. Maybe multicolored, maybe single color. The puppet can count. One, two, three, four. Maybe the puppet actually has spots on it and we can count the spots. And five, finally, letters. We can say the name of the puppet. What letters are in the name of the puppet? Or puppets are really good at singing A, B, C, D, E, okay? Letters, numbers, colors, shapes, language, sounds, and textures. All of that's always happening in the background while they're learning whatever it is that they want. So what does it actually look like? And what I want to do right, what I want to do right now is show you about a minute and a half clip from a lesson. So you can actually see a kid learn. And then I'm going to tell you um, about a couple of the skills that we use, which are like, what does all that mean, to be able to cultivate ILMs. So let's take a peek. Oops. Somewhere. In a lesson, 
I would go wherever you went. And that's called to follow. So what you saw was my learner going from, he went from the puzzle to a book. He then went over to that box. He then went over and grabbed an apple. He then went over and took a peek at how good he looks in the TV. He then went back over to me with the fruit and attempted to speak with apple in his mouth. And what did I do? I literally followed him. Wherever he went, I followed him. And the reason why I followed him is because, and I won't get into the sciencey stuff of this, neurologically, his brain is developing right now. He has 60% of a brain. So what I'm doing is I am going to go wherever that brain decides it wants to optimize what it processes and what it computes. And if I can stay in line with where he's going, that his brain can actually develop more optimally than the brain of another person who's actually being forced to learn things. Like today we're learning A, and that's an apple. Now come on, I know this is hard, but we're going to do this. The brain doesn't like that. Secondly, I'm using, you heard me talking, I am actually providing language for the very thing that the brain is focusing itself on. Think of that. The brain is like, I want to process and compute this. And then in comes all of this information that has to do with what it's actually focusing on. So I'm giving him the language he needs to be able to process and compute more optimally. Explosions, and not the real explosions, combinatorial explosions, and connections. In anything we're doing, I'm doing things like counting the number of grapes, right? Uh, let's go here. So I'm counting, uh, I count the pieces of fruit that were on there. We're saying the names of the letters. Uh, while we're talking about the box, I was saying, can you say what number it is? So I'm doing what's called an explosion. I'm creating lots of learning opportunities out of a single thing. The entire time that I'm doing this, my learner just thinks that he's playing or that he's doing his own thing, which he is. But in reality, I am cultivating my learners' intrinsic learning motivations. And we train our role models how to do this, and we have full-time staff who are experts in this approach that coach our, our role models, which are the volunteers, and the parents in how to do this for the kids every single week. So what do, who do we work with? Where do we work? We work in what's called a high-poverty community. And the really quick, dirty definition is to be qualified as a high poverty community, more than 75% of the students in that school system need to come from low or poor, low income or poor homes. More than 75%. In our community, East Palo Alto, that we work, 93% come from low income homes, 81% are below grade level. And if you're an English language learner, 91% are below grade level. Okay, let's zoom out, let's take a look nationally, what does it look like? 25% of students in this country go to school systems like that. 25%, that's a quarter of all students in the US. 15 years ago, that number was half the amount. High poverty is rising. And at the other end of the spectrum, it's called low poverty. Palo Alto is low poverty. That number is dropping. Most people focus on the middle of the bell. Well, if you really want to know what's happening in this country and what's going on, you should look at the tails, the high poverty and the low poverty, and it is not getting better. Finally, one million kids are starting kindergarten every year, already below grade level, and they have a better chance at failing than <clears throat> you have a better chance in Vegas of winning a million dollars than they have of actually making it through school. That's freaking nuts, but I will mind my manners. So, let me give you a couple of examples of what uh, some outcomes from our program look like, okay? So what you're looking at here is what we call motor development. This is my learner, he has autism. One month into the program, he's doing this. Most people would call that scribbling. We call that learning that your limb, when it moves and holds an instrument, can actually produce something in the world around you. E.g. motor development. 
When we notice that the kids like that, we start bringing things like Play-Doh or scissors or bolts and nuts so they can take the screws off or tweezers, things that they can use their hands because they really like that. Well, here it's hard to see, but at month five, he actually traced two letters, which are the letters of his mom's name. And then in month six, he randomly picked up a marker and drew the letter D without looking at anything no one told him to. And his name is Danny. And this was a jaw-dropping moment for me, even as the founder, to watch when I'm not even focusing on this, the children are learning this. So this is another learner who didn't really know how to identify the number one at six months in the program. And then at a year and a half in, he said 93% of the alphabet. Let me show you a little sneak peek of that. Now, let's put it up on the couch. All right, now let's see if we can find, let's see if we can find the number one. Number, one. where's number one? Right, right there. Orange one. Is what number is on the orange one? It's That's two. 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 That's two. That's close. Let's find the number one. Where's the number one? Is there a one? Let's see. Oh, you're right. There's a one on there, but there's also a zero, and that makes it ten. That's close. Um, oh, look at this. Which one is this? It's green. It's, and what number's on it? Eight. One. one. Jump on it. That's the one. Good. You did it. Okay, throw that one. Okay. So we found the number one. <laughs> now we're a year later. And let's see what he does. N N B H J. included with cultivating your ILMs. But to us, it's actually not enough to just know that it works while you're in our program. And if, if you didn't know this, most nonprofits can't even tell you what happens to kids after they graduate from their programs. But at 10BH, we think that to really earn our investment, to really prove what we do works, and to really understand whether we need to make changes, we should track kids after they finish. So our kids graduate at kindergarten, and we track report card data. And what we look at is how they do across 12 different subject areas. So we have three years of kids who have graduated, actually four. This is last year's results. We'll be uh, publishing this year's results toward the end of the year. And any number that you see in black is at or above grade level. And any number you see is, that is red, can you see that? Oh, it's very hard to see. These right here, these are red. That is red. Our below grade level. Remember, these are children from East Palo Alto, where 81% are below grade level. If you look at our kids by grade, they're at their above grade level as a cohort. And if you look at them by subject, they're at or above grade level in everything but one subject. And the real quick reason why we think they're below here is because we had to move from my apartment into our new office, and for eight months, I had to go search for a, a place for us to relocate to, and we had two part-time employees working in my apartment in my living room. So we think that they kind of suffered the brunt of that. So here's a couple of other outcomes. Kids that come into our program speaking straight up Spanish only, and six months are generally fluent in English. Their Spanish accelerates at very, very rapid rates. And children that come in with Down syndrome or speech delays, you saw my learner had autism, they accelerate beyond what the professionals are used to seeing. The doctors in East Palo Alto write prescriptions for 10 books at home. Literally, they're like, here, you need 10 books at home. And they give it to the parent. And then they give us a call and let us know that they've referred a family. One of the teachers of the kids with Down syndrome Literally, the parent needed to bring the kid into the classroom because the teacher thought did not believe her. His ILM was music. And so all he did was bring music. 
And he learned all of these words that were related to music, and the teachers were blown away. And finally, we did a, uh, uh, and it's an unpublished study with the preschool, and we looked at our kids who were in preschool versus the kids who were in preschool but that were not in our program. Our kids outperformed that in, in all seven areas of assessment. So what we realized from that is that uh, 10 Books to Home is a very important, crucial organization. It is not replaceable by preschool, but we encourage all of our families to go to preschool because when you live in a high poverty community, the odds are against you. The more that you can get before you start school, the better. And finally, the reason why we think that all of this is happening is because kids are spending time learning. So I got a question for you. Our kids spend five to eight hours a week learning, every week for two years. Question for you guys, raise your hands uh, to give me an answer. Who reads five to eight hours a week, nonfiction, for fun? Not for school, not for work, for fun. Like, should I go hang out? Should I go to the movies? Or should I like read, learn? Five hour, five to eight hours a week. And, hold on, for the last two years every week. Raise your hand if you think. You gotta be honest here. That's why our kids are entering kindergarten above grade level in a high poverty community. And parenthetically, they're also performing at and above grade level in Palo Alto school system, in Las Lamitas school system, in Portola Valley. It actually doesn't matter where they are. They're still doing very well. So why is it, and this is a pitch for you guys, actually. Why is it that they do so well? well we think that there are two ways to teach. You can either focus on potential or false potential. And we think almost all teaching focuses on false potential. And what I mean by that is this. We focus on the brain and what it wants to do, and we focus on what it wants to understand, and then we develop curriculum around that. In school, maybe you're familiar with this, your behavior is constantly monitored. Okay? I was always in trouble. And your output is always scrutinized. Grades, 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 grades. Knowledge, 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 knowledge. This is adults saying, this is what we want you to do. We understand the world and what it takes, so you just need to do what we say, and you'll be okay. We, on the other hand, tell me, I say, we actually don't have a clue about the world. In fact, every time an astronomer builds a bigger telescope, do you know what they say? We just realized the universe is even harder to see because it's so huge, we don't know much. So we want to focus on seeking to understand. And the way you know whether or not you're focusing on false potential or potential is this. You're constantly hearing things like, he doesn't like that. He doesn't know. He can't. He won't. That's how you know false potential is being focused on. But if you hear things like, he likes, he wants to, now you know that potential is being focused on. So here, mind experiment. Everyone close your eyes, please, and think for me one second. What do you really, really love, love, like a lot? Topic that you think is super freaking interesting. And then contrast that or juxtapose that with the topic you think is uninteresting. So something you think is interesting versus something you think is uninteresting. Take just five seconds. Okay. So let's stop. Time spent learning. Do you think that you are going to spend more hours learning about things you find interesting or uninteresting? Interesting. Okay, our learners too. Intensity of learning, okay? How much you focus and concentrate while you learn. Do you think you're, you're, being, you're learning more intensely when you're doing things you like or don't like? I, I think so too. Our, our learners would agree. What about talking to people about stuff? You think you're telling people about things that you like more than things you don't like? Now, complaining that you waited in line at the supermarket or whatnot doesn't count or at the movies. Because you actually are passionate and you're like, dude, we need to find a way to problem solve that. Because I don't like waiting in line. So it might appear you don't like something. Complaining about looking for solutions is also considered like. Okay. And this one's fun. Uh, memory. You think you're likely to remember more about things you like or don't like? I, our learners would agree. 
And we just finally got the technology to actually look inside of the brain and understand that. So long story short, when people are learning things they like, they're also likely to remember what's called incidental material. So if I were to flash photos of faces behind you, or right now, right here, if you're super freaking into this, you're probably going to remember the colors of these bars. You may even remember my, that I was wearing a hat. Versus if you weren't so interested, you might remember the content, some of the stuff I spoke about, but not necessarily the details that surround it. And just think about that. It's actually kind of common sense. So the main outcome of focusing on potential, we believe, is you learn a heck of a lot more than when you're basically forced to learn. Because it might go, more might go in, but it doesn't stick. And that, to us, is the real deal. But here's the thing, I have two case studies for you. Because here's, we can criticize this all the time. Oh, ILMC, that sounds like play. You know, it's just, they're just like playing. Number one criticism, they're just playing. Uh, children need to be challenged to learn. Well, I hope in these next two case studies to be able to change your mind if your mind is in that direction. And the first, the first is me. So you saw the gun, you saw the drugs, you saw all that. That was my life. I got kicked out at about 10 years old for the first time. I'm sorry, I smoked a cigarette. Got kicked out at about 12. Streets, I ran with thugs, I ran with uh, drug dealers, I went to juvie. That was my life. I uh, dropped out of high school. Uh, when I started attending the age, I hadn't even read kids' books. So I had to learn about what all those even were. While everyone else was like, oh my god, you're so cute. Well, fast forward to about 1999, and that's a bridge in Redwood City I lived under. I lived out of my car, homeless a number of times. But something happened in 2003 to me. I read that book. The only reason I read that book is a dude, one of my buddies, gave it to me. And I really looked up to him. I didn't know why, I just did it. I just like, looked up to the guy. And so I read it because of, of respect. You know, in, in, in the hood, when you got respect for people, you know, you show them, you, you, you do some things you wouldn't do. So I, I, I took it. And at 23, I read the first book ever in my life, cover to cover. More importantly than reading my first book, I discovered my ILM. The thing that I sought, my brain sought to understand. I read probably 15 to 20 hours a week for fun. On top of 10 books at home, on top of everything else, I freaking love learning. I got a cognitive neuroscience textbook in my trunk right now. I'm doing a PhD on my own. I love learning. That resulted in me going to college and getting a degree four years later in economics. I'd never even heard of economics. It was really fun. It was an ILM. So I got a degree in it. And then in 2009, I really, really wanted to help my community, the kids in my community, because I knew East Palo Alto. I ran the streets there. I understood the struggle, not to the degree that a lot of my friends did, but I understood the struggle. And so I founded a nonprofit called 10 Books at Home. I'm going to tell you right now, this was anything but easy. I have had to learn so much. It is unbelievable. But actually, I love challenges. If I'm not challenged, I will walk away. I need to be challenged now in my life because it's my ILM. And then I don't know if you guys have heard of a hole in the wall. Anyone raise your hand if you've heard of a hole in the wall? One. Dr. Evans, or Teacher Evans, Mrs. Evans, Miss Evans. Evans. <laughs> yes. All right, I'm going to show you a quick clip of a hole in the wall. Before I do so, let me prime that brain. These kids live in India, and they went and they stuck a computer in a wall out in a remote village in India. They loaded it up with a program on uh, molecular uh, biology in English, and they left for like three months, and then they came back. So let's see what happened. This experiment I did out of Newcastle was actually done in India, and I set myself an impossible target. Can Tamil speaking 12 year old children in a South Indian village teach themselves biotechnology in English on their own? And I thought I'd test them, they'll get a zero, I'll give them material, 
I'll come back and test them, they'll get another zero, I'll go back and say, yes, we need teachers for certain things. I called in 26 children, they all came in there, and told them that there's some really difficult stuff on this computer. I wouldn't be surprised if you didn't understand anything. Uh, it's all in English and uh, I'm, I'm going. <laughs> so I left them with it. I came back after two months and the 26 children marched in looking very, very quiet. I said, well, did you look at any of the stuff? Said, yes, we did. Did you understand anything? No, nothing. So I said, well, how long did you practice on it before you decided that you understood nothing? I said, we look at it every day. So I said, for two months you were looking at stuff you didn't understand. So a 12 year old girl raises her hand and says, literally, apart from the fact that improper replication of the DNA molecule causes genetic disease, we've understood nothing else. <laughs> It's just been published in the British Journal of Educational Technology. One of the referees who refereed the paper said it's too good to be true. So, um, I hear that all the time at 10 Books at Home. People say it's too good to be true. And one thing is that I want to leave with you about this is they ended up doing another study that looked at the group of kids at the hole in the wall versus kids in a state-sponsored school. And after six months, the kids at the hole in the wall were scoring at the same level as the kids in a state-run school. So the question I have for you guys is this. How the hell do we eliminate poverty? Uh, well, I, I have a guess. It's just a guess. Because that's like, you know, what it means to theorize. To guess. I think we need to forget about gaps. Forget about the achievement gap, the income gap, education gap, all these, throw all the gaps out. Because I think when you focus on a gap, what you're actually saying is I know what you need. I understand what you don't. And I don't think that is the most productive approach. I think what we need to do is we need to start focusing on learning. I think we actually need to focus on helping to identify and cultivate what it is that kids that people actually like to learn about and then cultivate that. Because I'm going to tell you something. I am not an anomaly. I am not an anomaly. I am not a genius. I am nothing. I'm just a dude that loves to learn. And I've done a lot of research. And these are some of my role models. And what I can tell you I found out about these people is that they too love to learn. And they found what they loved and they never stopped. This guy, Elon Musk, he read about rocketry to start his company. Do they, do, do they know rocket scientists? But you wouldn't question that. These guys up here, Tupac just sings. That's it. He sung his way into being a well-known, famous rapper. Einstein got lucky at a tutor and a friend that encouraged him to learn about what he loved. And so, what I want to say to all of you is I don't think it's only about poverty, I also think it's about you. I think that if you can choose what it is that you love and just pursue it beyond anyone else's expectations, you're going to be good in life. Trust yourselves. Thank you.